you know, the last few Sundays we've been looking at, uh, we've been studying this topic, uh, receiving God's guidance. Right? How many of you have been following, studying, receiving God's guidance? You know, such an important uh, topic, right? And uh, because we, all of us, we are in need of guidance. And, and guess what? God is there to give us guidance. The Bible is full of promises. We looked at that, that he's full of, he wants to guide us. He's not some God who's a far off, impersonal force, but he's with us. He's, he's alive, he's living, and he wants to be part of our life, an integral part of our life each and every day, right? And he wants to guide us, and he wants to lead us. The thing is that we need to be in a position to understand how he leads and understand how he guides. And we've been looking at several ways through which God guides us, right? We looked at how he speaks through his word, when the word is preached, the quickening of his word. We looked at how the Holy Spirit leads us and, and uh, prompts us and so on. And last Sunday, we looked at you know, prophecy and angelic visitations and dreams and visions and all the exciting stuff, right? And through it all, and I'm sure, you know, you would have, this exhortation or this, uh, uh, this instruction that we received is that we need to test. We need to test. The thing is this, that God is perfect. His word is perfect. He is good. But we as human beings, we have our limitations. So, uh, we as vessels, you know, we are imperf imperfect. So we need to test to see if what we are hearing is from God or not. That's the first thing. Is in line with God's word or not. And then scripture says in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21, hold fast to what is good. Hold fast. Which means do not hold fast to what is not good. Right? But hold fast. Get a strong grip on what is good. And, and that's the exhortation. And throughout this, the epistles, Paul writes and he says, you know, rightly divide the word. Rightly divide the word. Discern um, and test all things and understand what the will of the Lord is. And the reason is this. Because what we believe actually directs the cause of our life. What we believe changes our life completely. Because we live our life according to what we believe, right? Just look at, you know, uh, our own, you know, maybe homes or families. We take certain decisions, right? We, we decide, okay, this is where I want to work and this is where, this is how we're going to spend and this is what we're going to have and this is where we're going to live. And it comes from a place of conviction, strong conviction. We believe, our beliefs lead to conviction, and our convictions influence our choices, right? Now, I'm sure you've, you've seen that, that whole progression. Beliefs become our convictions. Our convictions influence our choices. Our choices influence our decisions or our actions, right? And our actions, and which lead to the way we live our life, which is really... Uh, you know, how we live our life affects our character and our, and our destiny. So it's very important what we believe. We know whom we believe, right? But what do we believe about, about God? What do we believe about the word? It's, it's so very important that it needs to be true. Because if what we believe is false, then our, we would have lived out a life that is false, Right? Um, I remember watching a small clip about, uh, I think this was called the Truman Show, I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not very sure, Truman Show. And, you know, this, this um, I think Jim Carrey is the actor, Pastor, you're talking about movies in church, I'm sorry, it's just an illustration. Right? This actor and uh, this whole life was actually lived in a TV set, right, in a studio, his whole life. The whole thing was set up, it was, so they wanted to make this uh, a best-selling uh, serial. Everybody was tuning in because everybody wanted to see how Truman was growing up. And Truman, at the, at the end, he, he, I think a, a stage light falls, and then he realizes that something is wrong. This world that he is in, something is wrong, something is artificial, something's fishy. And he's always been told not to cross that ocean. But, you know, there's a storm and everything. And then he crosses and then he, reach, he reaches the edge of that, 
ocean, what looks like a horizon, but it's actually a set. You know, his boat just hits that. And then he realizes that that is actually a set. And he, the movie ends where he opens that door and he steps out of that set. So he's a grown man now, but the whole life he has actually lived thinking that this was life, but actually it was not. It was a lie. It was something that was contrived. It was not reality. So what we believe is very important. And therefore, Paul writes, you know, test all things, discern, rightly divide the word, because God wants us to live according to the truth. Therefore, today's message is called The Lies We Believe. You know, it's a kind of negative, uh, negatively titled one, but just to bring out the contrast between a lie and a truth. We may not have, you know, may not think too much about a lie, you know. It's a lie. You say something which is not, which is false, which is not true, and, and you get by, get by and nothing happens. But let's look at, you know, the origin of lie, and the anatomy of a lie. What does, how does a lie impact, impact us, impact others? Okay, so let's look at John chapter 8 and verse 44. And the Lord Jesus is explaining something to the Jews, and he's having this conversation, and he's, and he's telling them this very hard statement. He's saying, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Okay, that's the first thing he says. He's talking about the devil and he's saying there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. He is, so the devil is a liar and the father of it, meaning he's the originator, or the creator, he's the designer of lies. How many kinds of lies do we have? White lies, gray, you know, he's the designer, the father of lies, the originator of lies. So the Lord makes it very plain. He's saying there is no truth in him. The devil is a liar and he's the father of lies. So in fact, that's one of the, his titles, Satan's titles, that he's the father of lies. There are other titles that he's called the deceiver. He's called the accuser. He's called the tempter. So he deceives, he accuses, and he tempts. And all the while, he uses his resources, and one of which, very powerful, is a lie. To accuse, to tempt. So what is the impact of this lie? What is the impact of this lie? A lie we know is a resource of the devil. So when you say a resource, you use a resource to accomplish something, right? You know, we, we have the sound system and everything. We, to accomplish, it's a resource. We use it to accomplish something for some objective, some result. So the lie is a resource of the devil. Lie is a resource of the enemy. And he uses it very cleverly to accomplish something, to accomplish his purposes. Now that's the first thing we need to understand. Lies accomplish the purpose of the devil. Okay. Let's look at this verse, John chapter 10 and verse 10. The Lord Jesus is speaking again and he's talking about the good shepherd and he's contrasting between the thief and himself. Okay. He's saying the thief comes, thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Steal, kill, destroy. And he says, I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Okay, see the contrast? The enemy comes to steal, the enemy comes to kill, the enemy comes to destroy. And he uses his resource, which is a lie, to steal. He uses his resource, which could be lies, to destroy, to, to really, um, to steal and to kill and to destroy. So, what happens if we use a resource, the resource of the enemy? Right? We do not fulfill the purpose of God. We, in fact, agree with the enemy. We start to use the resource of the enemy. We get on his agenda and not on God's plan and purpose. Right? So, lies do not fulfill the purposes of God. In fact, lies impair us and cause us to live life at a level that's far below 
what God intends for us. God wants us to live a life that's abundant, that's, that's good, because He is good. And He's come with that mission to, to be and to be that life-giving source itself and to, to give us a life that's full of life, an abundant life. So we do not fulfill that purpose. Right? We end up fulfilling the purpose of the enemy when we use lies. Uh, when we lie, you know, this is what we do. We, um, why do we lie, by the way? Anyone? Just think back. Maybe it was a long time when you lied back, you know. Why did we lie the first time? Right? Because we were caught, right? We wanted to cover up our mistake. We did something and we wanted to cover up. So when we lie, we, we want to cover up our mistakes. Sometimes we do it unintentionally. In a, in a moment of you know, pressure, we are cornered and we want to get out of it and we lie. Uh, we also lie to manipulate, to deceive and to cheat. To get something out of a person or out of a situation that's not rightfully ours. We want to force something out, so we manipulate, we deceive, we cheat and we use lies. We use lies to try and safeguard our own selfish interests, even though that, that could destroy another person or that could cause harm, or harm to another person. And we use lies to, you know, intentionally when we use lies, we, we use lies to inflict pain, to destroy someone's reputation. We use lies to get revenge. Right? So these are the impact of lies. You know, these are the many ways lies can be used. And the enemy uses lies. There's no truth in him. This is, this is a resource of the enemy. And he does it to accomplish his purpose. So as believers, we, we don't have, we, we, we should not have anything to do with the resource of the enemy, with the lies of the enemy. Let's look at truth for a minute. You know, John chapter 14 and verse 6, the Lord Jesus said, the Lord Jesus says to, um, you know, Thomas is there and Peter is there. And he has this conversation with them and he's saying, I am the way, the truth and the life. He's saying, I am the way and I am the truth. He's saying, you know, if we want to meet truth in person, it is the Lord Jesus. You know, he speaks truth. He points to the truth, but he is the truth himself. He's truth personified. He's saying, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. If you look at John chapter 1 and verse 14, this is what we see. John writing and he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the Lord Jesus. He's saying, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, lived among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He's saying we beheld his glory. He dwelt among us. He stayed with us. He moved with us. And we beheld his glory. And glory talks about who God is and what he does. The character of God, the very nature of God, the acts of God. Right? That's the glory of God. And he's saying... We beheld his glory. We saw his glory. We saw what he did. We saw what he spoke. We saw his acts. And he's saying they were full of grace and full of truth. There was no lying there. There was no manipulation there. There was no cheating there. There's no deceiving there. It was full of grace and full of truth. He's talking about the person of the Lord Jesus. Again, John chapter 16 and verse 13 this time, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. And he says, however, when he, the Lord Jesus is saying, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. So the Holy Spirit, he's called the spirit of truth. Lord Jesus, he is truth himself. He is the truth. The Holy Spirit is called the spirit of truth. And it says here that uh, the Lord Jesus is saying that he will guide you into all truth. You know, if you want truth, he will guide you into it. 
He will not guide you into ways of unrighteousness. He will guide you into all truth. His ways are true. And then he says, he will tell you things to come. In our own lives, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth will tell us things to come. And it will not be false. It will be the truth. He will tell us about our future. He will speak truth to us. He will not make false promises. He will not speak lies. So he will tell us of things to come and he will guide us into all truth. John chapter 17 and verse 17, the Lord says, Sanctify them. He's praying to the Father and he's saying, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Now, referring to the, you know, the written word, the inspired word, the quickened word. Your word is truth. Which means when God speaks, when God quickens, his word is truth. What he proclaims, what he declares over us, what he sings over us. You know, Zephaniah 3 and verse 10, he says, he rejoices over us with singing. What the Lord God sings over us, what the Lord God proclaims, declares, what the Lord God instructs us, his word is truth. There's nothing false. There's nothing, you know, um, there's nothing deceitful. And he's saying, Lord, sanctify them. Father, sanctify them by your word. Your word is truth. Set them apart. And one more word, one more scripture. Uh, Hebrews 6 and verses 17 to 18. Um, Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability or the unchangeability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. And verse 18 says that by two immutable things, Two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. It is impossible for God to lie. And because of that, he says, we might have strong consolation. Have you met someone who cannot lie? I've met people who, for whom it's very difficult to lie. Very difficult to lie. Right? So, when they are cornered, they get very nasty. They don't speak the truth, but they are in a position where, you know, they are so upset with themselves, they are so upset with the situation, and they, they behave weirdly. Right? But it is possible for them to lie. And here we see, this is immutable, unchangeable things. He confirmed it with an oath. He's talking about the covenant, and it is impossible for God to lie. Now, what has God spoken over you? What has God spoken over your life? You know, sometimes we doubt it. Right? And, and it's, it's natural. You know, did I hear right? Was it from God? And these are good things to ask ourselves. But over a period of time, when we don't see those things happen or manifest, you know, we begin to doubt. God, did you really say it? And did you say it to me? Scripture declares that it is impossible for him to lie. It is impossible for God to lie. And I think that would make us just run to him. That would just want us to be with him all the time. So irresistible. Not only does he speak the truth, you know, speak, truth can be painful at times. Am I looking good? No. Truth can be very direct. You know, is, does it taste good? No. It can be painful. But the fact is that he's full of grace and full of truth. What a combination. Amen. Praise God. You know, this is the God we worship. This is Jesus. This is whom we have invited into our lives. This is whom we lay down our life for. This is the one who guides us. This is the one who holds our future. You know, it's impossible for him to lie. He's full of truth. At the same time, he's full of grace. Which means he speaks the truth in love. It will hurt. But then at the same time, he will heal us. That's our God. So what is the impact of truth? It's life in its fullness. The same verse, John 10 and verse 10. Lord Jesus says, this is my mission. I have come that you might have life 
and have in its fullness, have in its abundance. So to carry out his purposes, he releases truth. He speaks truth. He directs us by his truth. Right? So when we receive that truth, it is life in fullness. He carries out the purposes. So truth does the very opposite of a life. Truth restores and does not steal, does not take away. Truth does not steal away joy. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, if I tell the truth, that will be the end. Yes, we will go through a season of maybe restoration, maybe, you know, we might have to suffer the consequences of our act, but truth restores, does not steal. Amen? Truth dis- restores, because lie steals. Lie promises, but in the end it actually steals. But truth restores. The second thing we see is that truth gives life and it does not kill. It does not kill dreams, does not terminate things. Truth gives life because he is life itself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So truth gives life. Truth does not kill, does not take away. And also, truth does not destroy, but it's actually constructive. Truth builds. You know, in relationships, truth actually builds. Marriage, truth builds, does not destroy. Of course, truth with grace. We're talking about truth with love. Truth in wisdom of God. Truth, you know, undergirded by love, by the love of God. If we look at that again, the Spirit of God pouring out His love in our hearts. So, truth undergirded by that. So, Truth actually builds, it does not destroy. So we don't have to be afraid of the truth. And another thing about truth is this, um, how it impacts us. Hebrews 13 and verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Matthew 24 and verse 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So the person who's truth himself, and the words that he speaks. He's saying, you know, heaven and earth will pass away, right? And here, Hebrews talks about how he is the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means that truth is eternal. Truth is eternal. Whereas lie is temporary. Truth is eternal. Can we say that again? Truth, it it, it is eternal. Truth is eternal. Which means that truth outlives and overcomes the lie. Praise God. Praise God. You're saying, you know, maybe there, you know, some people have spoken lies and you're not able to change that that circumstance. Praise God. God is our vindicator. But the fact is this, that truth outlives and overcomes the lie. Amen? Right. And also, truth uncovers what the lie has hidden. If you look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus, right? We look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus and he, we know he went about doing what he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. We went about doing it good. You know, he, he spoke truth. He ministered truth. He spoke about the kingdom. He drew people to the heart of the Father through the parables and so on. And, and, he, and, he, and he healed the sick. He, he raised the dead. He, he, in all that, he was just showing the heart of the Father. And he spoke truth. In his ministry, he actually demonstrated this is what truth is. And when he demonstrated truth, it dismantled or destroyed the works of the enemy. Hallelujah. You know, that's our God. That's our God. Let's look at Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And, you know, the Lord, actually, this is the prophecy in Isaiah 61. Um, and uh, the Lord actually reads that out in a synagogue. This is, what, this is how it goes. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Acts 10, verse 37 and 38 says, 38 says that 
God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So how were they oppressed by the devil? Because he used his schemes. He used his resources. One of which was lies. The Lord Jesus went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. You know, when you, you have a picture of oppression, it's like maybe you, you've seen some people, um, you know, unloading, unloading from a, maybe there's a truck there and, you know, there's, there, there are these huge sacks of rice or, you know, something there, groceries which are there and you see them unload and they just bend under that weight. What happens if you put two more sacks on it? You know, they just cannot move. Right? So the devil just specializes in doing that, oppresses us, brings us to a place where we are unable to move, unable to decide, unable to go back or go forward. The devil oppresses. And the Lord Jesus saw those who were oppressed by the enemy. They were oppressed maybe by the religious system. They were oppressed by something that was happening in their bodies. They were oppressed by society, ostracized. You remember, he came and touched the lepers and cleansed them. So he came and he set at liberty those who were oppressed. And that is what we see here. And today, the Holy Spirit is here among us to do the very same thing. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's called the Spirit of Truth. The Lord Jesus said, you know, I will send another helper who will be with you, who will teach you, who will remind you, and so on. And he said, you know, go wait. He told the disciples, go wait in Jerusalem. You'll be filled, you'll be endued with power to be witnesses, to do the same things. And he says, if you believe in me, you know, you will do the very same things that I do, and greater things. John chapter 14 and verse 12. And it's through the power of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is here to do the very same things. Amen. The very same things. John chapter 16 and verse 13, when this, he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. So which means that the truth he brings is good news where lies have brought hopelessness and despair. Right? The ministry of truth. It's good news where lies have brought hopelessness and despair. Is there hopelessness and despair in our lives? or in the lives of people maybe we have seen, the ministry of truth brings hope. The ministry of the Lord, ministry of the Holy Spirit brings good news. Good news. His truth will heal hurts or heal hearts that have been broken by lies. His truth will heal hearts that have been broken by lies. Okay. I don't know how many broken hearts are here. Right? But the truth of God, He will heal broken hearts. Many times we, we protect those hurts and we are ashamed of those hurts. But the fact is, when we expose our lives, when we expose our hearts and our hurts, to him who is the truth, there will be healing. He will heal the brokenhearted. His truth sets free those who have been imprisoned by lies. The people said, you know, we are not the Jews of his time. We are, not, we are not in bondage. We are not prisoners. And maybe we are saying the same thing. We are not prisoners. We are free. You know, I can go. I can get up and go in the middle of the sermon. It's, you know, I'm a free man. I'm a free woman. Right? But the fact is that we could be imprisoned by so many things. We could be imprisoned by hate. We could be imprisoned by bitterness. So, when, so what I mean is, you know, when somebody is imprisoned, they are unable to do things that they would normally want to do, that they would normally like to do. Incarcerated, imprisoned. Right? So we could be imprisoned by hate. It means we hate someone. And we don't want to do what God wants us to do in that situation or in, to that person. We could be imprisoned by bitterness. We could be imprisoned by our own addictions and lust. We could be imprisoned. 
But the fact is that truth sets us free. I just want to read that verse again. It says that the Lord Jesus said, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom, liberty to the captives. Captives to sin, captives to all these kind of prisons. And he also says, recovery of sight to the blind. His truth brings, opens the eyes that have been blinded by lies. I remember watching that video where this young boy and he, uh, for the first time, you know, he, he, his vision is such that, his condition is such that he can see only, um, you know, black and white, only monochrome, right? And uh, they, uh, they designed a glass, they, get, they designed a pair of glasses, and he, for the first time, after wearing that, he could see color. Right? And he, he was, he's just enthralled. He just sees color for the first time. He sees the greens, and he sees the blues, and he's just enthralled. He's saying, this is so beautiful. It's as if his eyes have been opened for the first time. He sees all that and in fact, he breaks down crying and he's just hugging his family and he's saying, this is beautiful, this is beautiful. And lies actually blind our eyes to the truth. Lies blind us. It's like the thing could be there right in front of us but then lies blind us. But truth opens those eyes. He came to open the eyes of the blind. Normally we look at it at a physical, you know, in a physical sense, but the fact is that it also means in a spiritual sense that he'll open the eyes of those that have been blinded by lies. And his truth brings liberty and freedom to those who have been oppressed by lies. You know, many times we, we live a life of lies, and we think that is freedom. And we think, okay, this is how it is. This is how the situation is. I can't get over it. I can't overcome it. So let me just accept and let me just live. But truth sets us free. You know, I'm standing here as a person who's been set free by the truth. And I want to tell you, truth is beautiful. Truth is wonderful. You don't have anything to be afraid of. Right? You know... Certain things happened in my life where <clears throat> I was traumatized and uh, I couldn't speak in front of people, okay? Uh, people today don't believe that and I say that. But the fact is this, that I would hesitate to talk to people. Uh, I would hesitate to believe another person. But I want to tell you this morning that truth sets you free, completely free, right? Where you end up doing something foolish. You have to go to the other extreme, right? Truth sets you free. There's so much freedom. It's like you're able to breathe again. It's like the, releasing the fish back into the water. You're in that environment again. This is the right environment. I was in a, you know, I was in the wrong place. It's like releasing a fish back into water. Truth sets us free. Let's look at a few. Are you all listening? Okay. Um, so, Let's take a check, you know, let's take a truth check, a truth scan, if you want to call it that, right? Let the Holy Spirit scan us and say, hey, this is actually not true, right? So can we do that? You know, as we go through this next 15 minutes, I just want us to, I just request us to just pray and say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. You know, I, I, know, I know we do that, uh, but don't close your eyes and pray. Uh, okay, just open your eyes and keep praying, <laughs> saying, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Holy Spirit, speak to me. Right? Okay, so let's look at a few scenarios. Let's look at the first thing. You know, when, uh, what do we do? When the Holy Spirit says, this, this is a lie that you've been believing, what do I do? You know, first I test, I check. Uh, I check with the word. Yes, Holy Spirit. Yeah, this is what the truth says, and I've been believing a lie. So what do I do? I repent. Right? I repent of the lie. I, I, and then I reject the lie. So you identify it, Holy Spirit speaks to us, we test it, we check, and then we repent, we reject the lie. And that's not the end of the story, we accept the truth. We receive the truth, gladly. We declare the truth, okay? And when we walk out of here, we live out the truth. Because there will be times when the enemy will again remind us, hey, you know what, this is who you are, this is what you are. But then we live out the truth. You know, we reject the truth, we reject the lie and we live out the truth, okay? So let's look at uh, the first thing, you know, our appearance. 
How many of you are proud of yourself, of the way you look? Pleased. Okay, let's not use the word proud. Pleased. Okay. Uh, you don't have to raise your hands, but the fact is that some of us are not. And most of us are not. Maybe there's some part of us that we are not pleased I'm not saying that, uh, you know, that we should not work out or we should not take care of our bodies or, you know, uh, or, you know but in a healthy way, right? I'm not saying also that we should be obsessed with the way we look and, you know, keep checking ourselves in the mirror. No, no, but in a healthy way, right? Our appearance, are we pleased? When we look at the mirror in the morning, are we pleased? Okay. What do we tell ourselves when we look at ourselves? Now, you might be a young person, you might be, you know, middle-aged, old, it doesn't matter, across your age. Do you look at yourself and say, I wish I was like that person? You know, media is not helping us. Media is feeding us, bombarding us with images, saying, this is how you should be. Hey, this is success. This is how your hair should be. You should have hair. Come on. That's a lie. <laughs> this is how your hair should be. This is how you, your clothes should be. This is how, where you, this is, this is where you should live and you've arrived. What about your appearance? When you look at yourself, you know, do you hate yourself? Do you devalue yourself when you look at yourself in the mirror? You know, by all means, you know, let's all work out and let's stay healthy. In fact, Definitely tomorrow, I think I'm going to register for the gym. The gym, I just have to roll out of bed and roll into gym, right? It's just behind where I stay. But yeah, that's something that I need to do. But the fact is this, when we look at ourselves in the mirror, what goes into our minds? I want to share a couple of truths from scripture, okay? So you just check. Holy Spirit, you speak to me. Ephesians 2 and verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are his workmanship. That Greek word there is poema, which means work of art, from which we get the word poem. Poema, work of art. We are his workmanship. Now just allow that word to sink in. Let it sink in. Let the truth sink in. You know, I am his workmanship. I am the workmanship of God. His workmanship. Right? Created in Christ Jesus for good works. I am his workmanship. Just turn to your neighbor and say, you are his workmanship. Come on. I see some people who are not doing that. You are his workmanship. Right? Now turn again and tell them, I know. <laughs> I believe that. This is the truth. Right? We are his workmanship. Let's look at another psalm. Psalm 139 and verse 14. Okay? Another truth statement it says, um, but the psalm is saying, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Maybe people have spoken certain things over you and uh, you begin to believe that and not really checked with what the truth is. Word of God is like a mirror. It shows us where we stand when we encounter truth in these pages. Right? It shows us, hey, this thing that we have, that you thinking is not right. I am his workmanship. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. So let not anyone else, you know, destroy that. Let not anyone else put you down. There could be many reasons why we could, you know, devalue ourselves. Or, but let's, let's come back to the truth. The second one is about our identity, you know, who we are, okay, who we are, uh, our self-worth, our value, who we are. What's, what is it based on? Just think about it, who I am, you know, my self-worth, my value, what is it based on? 
Now, it could be based on many different things. It could be based on our bank balance. If a bank balance is good, then that day we feel good. If it's low, then we don't. Our, bank, our identity could be based on our education. You know, maybe we've got many things, you know, after our name, right? Maybe you're saying, hey, the thing that I put there, I have to put a dash on top of it. I'm not yet, which means, you know, you're not yet completed. So I'd rather not put that. What is our identity? What are, what are we basing it on? Is it based on our position? You know, many times when we, when proposals come and we check, right, we, we ask, you know, just find out the background. You know what is it, right? So the wife, uh, I mean, the, the girl side, they give a proposal and, and this, is, this is what it is. And then they say, tell someone, find out the background. So what, do you, what they mean is, you know, what is their status? What is their social status? You know, what is the, what is the financial status? What is the education? What is, what is their background? You know, this morning, I want to ask you, what is your background? What is it that we can base our identity on? I met someone many years ago, first time in meeting him, I think he shared that, you know, he introduced himself and he said, hey, I'm so-and-so and I'm from Volvo. Right, we are meeting in a church, he's just talking, I'm from so-and-so, I'm from Volvo. So his identity was actually the fact that he was working for Volvo. It was just wrapped all around, right? The thing is this, what happens when we meet someone who's more skilled than us. What happens when we come across someone, you know, who, who has a few more degrees more than us? What happens when we retire? When that position is not there anymore? I recently saw an ad. It was, a, it was an ad by BMW, actually, but uh, it, He's talking about the CEO or the director of Benz. Uh, he comes and, uh, you know, it's, it's a send-off. So he comes home and he opens his garage and he drives out a BMW. And he says, free at last. You know, he's working for Benz all along. He couldn't drive a BMW. But, the, but in that, they show very clearly, you know, the company comes and take, takes away his company car and, and all that. What if, you know, when you retire, what is your self-worth? Right? When you're not able to do those things that you used to do anymore. This is what scripture says. Okay. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Okay. We are a new creation. We are in Christ, loved by the King of kings and Lord of lords, indwelt by majesty. You know, we declare that, right? The greater one is in me. That's our identity. The fact that we are sons and daughters of the Most High God, and He owns the cattle on a thousand hill. The gold is mine, says the Lord. The silver is mine, says the Lord. He has infinite wisdom. The omnipotent one, the omniscient one. He is our God. And we, he is our father and we are his sons and daughters. Right? That's our identity. So we, we can be so secure. We can walk into any room with any number of people, with whatever, you know, however skilled they are, and we can love them and not be defensive. Right? If we are secure in our identity. And this is what truth is. This is the declaration of truth. It's not to make us slothful. It's not to make us not strive for excellence, not be excellent in our... No, it's not that. But this will actually free us. You know, we said truth frees us, right? Truth is constructive. Truth builds us up. And that is what it does. I just want to uh, read from Habakkuk chapter 3. You know, it's, it's actually a testimony, right? Habakkuk chapter 3, the last chapter in Habakkuk. And uh, if you read from verses 17 onwards, okay, this is Habakkuk saying, he's saying, though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, nor, uh, though the labor of the olive may fall, or fail, sorry, 
and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stall. It's a pretty grim picture. You agree? Yeah, he's saying, you know, there's no fig tree, uh, there's no fruit, there's no uh, this thing, olive, there's no uh, flock, there's no herd. And, and verse 18, he says, yet I will rejoice. Yet I will rejoice. He's saying, you know, my business is out. There's nothing happening. It's all in the red. And he's saying, I will rejoice. Yet I will rejoice. And he's saying, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And he's saying in verse 19, the Lord God is my strength. He is the one who makes me strong. My strength is in him. He is my support. You know, he is my support system. It's not, it's not the business that I have. It's not you know, what's happening. It's not the titles that I have. It's not my standing in society. It's not, it's not that. It's not church, ministry. It's not that. He's saying the Lord God he is my strength. Amen? Saying the Lord is my strength. The Lord God is my strength. And he, and he goes on to say, hey, you know what? He will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on the high hills. He will do that. And in fact, it's a song. He's saying, you know, just sing it. It's, it's given to the chief musician. And he's saying, with my stringed instruments. Right? You see that footnote there. He's saying, this is my song. The Lord will make me. Because my strength is in Him, even though these things are not happening, the Lord is well able to restore. And the Lord is well able to bring back. And therefore, I will joy, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will rejoice in Him. Therefore, my identity, you know, we can go on all day like this. What about purpose? You know, we, we think that, we look at young people and we say, okay, look at them, you know, not planning, no sense of purpose. You know, this lack, sense of lack of purpose can come to any age. I remember having a conversation with you know, a very senior person. And I'm not, not a very senior person, an elderly person. And the person, you know, he, she is done everything. The children are married. She has grandchildren. And so she was saying, you know, what else is there in life? What else is there? That's all. It's all over. Right? Just almost like I'm waiting for the end. No. Now, whether you're a young person and saying, oh, there's no purpose, I've had it all, I've experienced it all, you know, there's, no, there's nothing, there's no sense of purpose, or whether you're an old person, elderly one, the scripture says, we are his workmanship, that same verse, create in Jesus for good works, which God pre prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So for all of us, God has prepared good works. Let's look at another scripture, Psalm 139. Verse 16, your eyes saw my substance yet being unformed. And in your book, they were all written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. So in God, we have purpose. So that's the truth. The speaker of truth declares purpose over our lives. You know, when we, at times when you think, you know, uh, this lack of purpose is it's very dangerous, right? You get up in the morning and you don't want to get up out, out of bed. What is there? How can I go through my day? You, you want to hit the bed early, but then it's like sleep doesn't come. You're just waiting for the morning, waiting for the night, waiting for the morning. Sometimes it's like waiting for the weekend. You, know, you go to work, but I'm waiting for the weekend actually. Weekend, waiting for the weekend, partying on the weekends and getting back. No sense of purpose, fulfillment or contentment. But in Christ, saying there are good works that are prepared. Purposes, good works. And he's, he wants us, he wants to guide us into those good works. Hallelujah. Yeah. So that we might fulfill them, we might discover them and fulfill them. Uh, ability and so many other things. But I just want to close with this that, you know, as believers, we struggle with maybe sin and saying, I can never live that life. We struggle with fear and we're saying, maybe, you know, I don't want to get into that, that God has for me. We remember talking to uh, a young person. Uh, we all grew up together, you know, um, and in our youth group. And, and then this person used to, 
you know, move in the gifts, right? Receive the baptism of the Spirit and move in the gifts and so on. But for some reason, fear entered her. And uh, she said, is it of God? Is it not of God? And she said, I want nothing to do with it, right? It could be the area of gifts, spiritual gifts that God wants to give us so that the church might be edified. We are, maybe we are saying we are holding back. It could be in, in, in some other area of your life where we are saying, you know, I'm sinful and I'm, I'm, I'm unable to overcome, I'm able, unable to come out of this, therefore, you know, this will be, my, this will be it, this will be my purpose, this will be my destiny. And it's so restricted and falls short of what God has for us. Okay. Now this is what scripture says and it, decla and it declares in Romans 6 and verse 6, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Okay. The lie from the enemy is that you can never overcome. The lie from the enemy is that you can never get out of this prison. I've locked it, I've thrown the keys off, and, and you cannot escape. But the declaration of truth is that we are no longer slaves of sin. We are no longer slaves of sin. We've been crucified with Christ. Now can we say that together? I have been crucified with Christ. And the old man was crucified with him. Right? We're talking about the body of sin. And it says, I'm no longer a slave of sin. So we are actually set free. God declares this truth over us. Okay. And though the enemy might be trying to speak lies and saying, you are in this position, you will never get out. I don't know what lies the enemy has been whispering. But this morning, this afternoon, let's receive the truth from the speaker of, from the proclaimer of truth. Let's receive the truth from the spirit of truth and be set free. Man, you know, I was not a good boy always. <laughs> okay. uh, I lived a life that was a dual kind of life. Okay. As a believer, and I'm, you know, I'm sharing this as a believer, right? And this is many years ago before, you know, coming into ministry and so on. So, so I used to travel on work. So, Work took me to different places. I used to travel on work. I'd come back and weekends, of course, you know, serve in church and worship and so on. But, but the fact is that, the fact was that I was, uh, I was addicted to many things. Okay, one of which was pornography, right? So I would travel on work and uh, completely, you know, just fill my mind with, with pornographic images. I would come back and... I would step away from serving in church because you don't, you know, you don't have the confidence to, to step in and serve God. There's guilt and shame and condemnation, right? And pornography gives a false sense of intimacy. And in fact, you know, our marriage, praise be to God, it's only by the grace of God that he sustained it because, you know, it, the fact is that it would have just broken if it was not for God. And the fact is that God exposed me to the truth at a time when I thought that everything was lost. You know, I used to think, oh God, maybe, maybe in heaven when I meet you, you know, that's when this whole thing will end. Right? Because the enemy was whispering lies saying, you will always be addicted to this. You will never come out of this. And it so happened that just to anesthetize all the pain, you know, I started drinking, drinking heavily. So you can imagine, there's this man who's got a call of God, he's got the promises of God, there's been prophecies and everything, who's stuck in addiction. And to, you know, try to make sense of it, he's also started drinking. And in fact, I remember one day I was, I was in my hotel room and uh, I forget which place, but I was holding a drink in my hand and I was... I was looking at the mirror and I was saying, cheers, pastor. Because that was the prophecy which was given, like, you will serve God, you will be a pastor. But things went downhill, right? So this is what a lie can do in our lives. Completely imprison us to his purposes, purposes of the enemy. 
But God never let me down. He pursued me. He pursued me. And exposed me to the truth. I remember once, you know, I, I clearly remember I was in Mangalore. I visited a client coming back to my hotel. And, and my wife called and, and out of the blue, and she asked me, you know, are you doing this? And now she has asked me that question many times before. And I'd always said, no, 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 you know how I am. But that day, and I, I think a few days before that, I'd started praying. I'd saying, God, I, I'm sick and tired, God. I'm sick and tired. No matter what consequence, you know, let it be. I'm, I want to be done with. And she, uh, she called me and asked me, are you doing this? You know, are you watching this? Are you doing this? And for the first time, after all those years, I said, yes. Yes, I am. You know, you, you must understand that uh, my wife and I, we know each other from children's church days. You know, children's church. You went to Sunday school together, church, youth group, all that. So we know each other for many years. And for the first time, she was seeing someone who had worn a mask all his life. That's what lie does. Up till that point, I had lived a life of lie, thinking, it'll be okay. I can handle it. I can manage it. God will forgive. Of course he will forgive. But he cares too deeply for us to, for us to remain in that place, for me to remain in that place. So I remember sitting down on that, you know, on that road, by the roadway, uh, roadside in Mangalore, and, and uh, it took us, I think, a year's time to really get back for God to heal, to bring about that process of healing, to build trust again. Because every photograph that you see will remind you, hey, this guy was wearing a mask. Was that genuine? Right? Did he say something that was genuine? You see how it is? But the truth of God does not destroy. When you hold on to truth, it was the most painful one year of our lives. But God builds back. He restores. He builds back. And he sets us free. And he sets us so free that you're able to share with others and testify to others to the glory of God. Right? So he takes away the shame. He takes away the guilt. And he sets you free. So this morning, I want to encourage us, you know, we can look at many scenarios, maybe things that, maybe, you know, in your own marriage, maybe in your own families, maybe at office. You know, what is the lie that was spoken to you that you've accepted and just living it as if it's the truth? Now let the spirit of truth set you free. Let the liberator set you free and take you through a process of walking in victory. Amen. Man. So we're just going to pray and I just call the worship team up and um, oops, the okay, mic stands are not here, but um, just kind of. So let's take some time to pray and let's ask, God, ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, what is it? What is the lie that I'm believing? What is the lie that I'm harboring? What is the lie that I'm encouraging? You know, what is, the what is the lie that I'm, you know, I'm just using on others, either to control or to, yeah, uh, I think that's, okay, yes. um, okay um, right, so let's, let's ask the Lord to show us you know, we believe that you know, our God is living, He's alive, He's, He speaks. Our God is a speaking God and He will speak to your heart right now. Lord, we ask that You, that you would speak to us right now, that You would expose. Lord, we, we come and we, we just want to be vulnerable before You because You are someone whom we can trust completely. Completely, God. We don't have to put on a mask in front of you, God. We don't have to put a mask on.
we can come and just be ourselves you know everything about us inside out god and this morning we just come for a cleansing we come for lord what your blood achieved for us on the cross 2000 years ago we just pray we ask spirit of god that you would cover us with your precious blood that you would wash us with your precious blood father cleanse us as a psalm has said oh god purge us lord let there be a thorough cleansing god cleansing of all that is false you know sometimes lord we we just hold on to things culturally we you know we hold on to certain things but god we just release that we just release that this morning we pray that you would cleanse us cleanse us lord you now let the word of god wash us this morning cleanse us god wash us wash us with your word today come on let's just engage with god just open up our hearts just invite him call upon your name come spirit of god for the fresh for the fresh on us yeah god hey there's no fear in love you know he loves us so we don't have to be fearful of coming to him and and turning our lives over to him now many times when we face the truth the question would be oh how can this be but that how can things get better you know that was my question too you know how can this be how can things get get better and that was mary's question when the you know angel brought the word and said no this is how it will be with you mary and when she, and her response was how can this be how can this be but then she turned to she said may it be to me according to your word and this morning we want to encourage us you know we might be asking that question but how can things change how can this be if i invite jesus if i invite the spirit of god into my life to clean my life to change my life to face the truth which could be painful will think things get better how can this be i just want to encourage us can you say Lord may it be to me according to your word. May it be to me according to your word for your word is truth indeed. And your word sets me free for your truth sets me free. For your truth liberates me. For your truth lifts me up from where I am to where I need to be. Lord your truth lifts me up to a higher realm in you God. Here it is here it is Your truth opens my eyes to your promises to see things as they are.
Would you like to stand up and just declare this? I'm no longer a slave to fear. No, I won't. Oh, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, yes. I am a child. Sing it again. Declare it again. I'm no longer. thank you this morning that for this beautiful truth of oh God that we are your children you know before we pray further I just want to ask you know, if there's anyone here and you want to invite Jesus into your heart you, know, you could have been visiting church over and over again and doing everything religious but you know if there's anyone here and you and you want to invite Jesus you know invite truth into your life so that all lies are dispelled if you invite truth Jesus into your heart you know you can do so this morning you know and it's a simple invitation um, you can just ask the Lord to come into your life and say Lord Jesus you can pray something like this saying Lord Jesus I believe that you died for me on the cross and that your blood washes me from all sin I believe that you you were you died for me and that you rose again on the third day and you removed everything that was preventing me from coming to you you moved sin out of the way come into my life Jesus you can pray that prayer just say come into my life Lord Jesus change my life and um, if there's anyone here and if you pray that prayer for the very first time you know you can put your hand up. Just want to acknowledge. We want to help you. Uh, give some resources. Is there anyone here? You pray that prayer for the very first time. Is there anyone? Anyone? For the very first time. Okay. No? Okay. Uh, if there's anyone and you you did not put up your hand, you know, you feel free to stay back. Just want to pray with you and help you get started. Okay. Now, let's just pray and declare truth to be embedded in our hearts now let's pray and ask God Lord you lead us you know we could be so entangled in lies that without thinking you know we we can't figure out a way out but let's ask the Lord Lord you break the stronghold you break this chain and Lord you set me up on a path out of this right so let's pray. Father, we thank you. The truth is that we are no longer slaves. The truth is that the prison door is open. God, the truth is, oh God, that you've broken every chain. And this morning, I just declare that truth, Lord, over your people, God. Lord, the truth that I experience, the freedom that I experience, I just declare it. I just release that, Lord, over every, or each and every person here in whatever lie they, they might be entangled in big or small I just pray that the spirit of the holy God just break that that break that chain that break that thing that is holding and release freedom and release you into freedom I just pray also that may the Lord set you on a path of recovery there might be steps that you need to take there might be people with whom you might need to meet up, maybe a Christian counselor, maybe a pastor, and feel free to do that. You know, there's no stigma, right? Whatever depths of lies that you're entangled in, God wants you out. God wants you to live the life that he has for you. So maybe you need someone to help you along that way. So feel free to meet with someone, pray with someone, 
and i would suggest you know meet with a christian counselor or a pastor or a leader and uh, to walk with you through this path of recovery and may the lord set us free and cause us to walk in the high hills may the lord strengthen let's sing that bridge again again. and over our circumstances God we thank you we thank you hallelujah hallelujah the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance upon you and fill you with a shalom amen we trust that this message was a blessing to you we would love to hear from you you can email us at contact at apcwo.org Also visit our website abcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.